Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 03636 59 0703 768 Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. like us to turn to the text that we have that is more or less the center of what we have been saying and doing that is uh, just to bring our minds together I will start with that 2 Corinthians chapter 3 the verses 1 to 6 and then chapter 5, verses 9 to 15. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Reading from NIV. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, Letters of recommendation to you or from you. You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts and known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ. The result of our ministry written not with ink but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Not of letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Chapter 5, verses 9. To 15. So we make it our goal to please him. Whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each of us may receive what is due for us. For the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know that it is to fear the what We know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again but we are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen Rather than in what is in the heart. 
if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all and they have all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. But for him who died for them and was raised again. Thank you again for the privilege to share from the word of God on this topic, on this theme. The theological educator, the necessary life exposures and victories for effectiveness. This is an exposition of 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 to 6, 5 verses 9 to 15, and 6 verses 1 to 11. But we are not talking of chapter 6 verses 1 to 11. That will come up under the second part of this theme. The first that we are dealing this evening is the theological educator, the necessary life exposures. And tomorrow, we look at the theological educator, the necessary, li the necessary victories for effectiveness. Centering on chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. For today is 3, 1 to 6, and 5, 9 to 15. I'm glad to be part of this Congress. Brothers and sisters, theological education is far more than being conversant, conversant with one's subject and delivering that subject to one's students. If the theological educator must do his work or her work satisfactorily, effectively, and with a high level of success. He or, he or she must also be conversant, not only, with, with, not only with the subject of her expertise, but conversant with herself or himself, Conversant with God and conversant with the necessary values. This is because education is not merely an exercise of the brain or mind. Education is the working towards the improvement of the life and awareness of human beings for greater benefit of both, listen, of both the educator himself or herself and the one being educated. This therefore means that if we, we theological educators today in seminaries would be useful instruments in the hands of God in our perverted generation, we need to understand what God, what made God to desire a learned Pharisee of the old covenant, like Saul of Tarsus. It is interesting to note that it was his deep understanding of himself. His academic attainment at a rabbinic, as a rabbinic scholar 
and his deep devotion to the concretizing of that knowledge. He was not contented with merely hate knowledge of the subject. The Torah. But a knowledge that was that made him to be devoted to the God he knew and the values he knew. However, not well informed. It was out of his desire to live what he knew that led him to persecute the young church that was imagined. Because he felt it was standing on the path of the sure word of God he knew. And because in times of ignorance, God overlooks. God made Saul of Tarsus on his way to persecute Christians. And commanded Ananias saying, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So God was not simply sabotaging Paul's plans to persecute the young church. Not at all. That was not his primary purpose. More than that, his honest, it, he was concerned about, he was so intrigued about his honesty of heart and commitment to a cause. He was a good material in God's new covenant in Jesus Christ. Because of his honesty and his commitment. This means that the real problem God has with theological educators today is not so much our incorrect theology. Because such can be easily addressed by God as he did with Saul of Tarsus. But the problem God has with today's theological educators is lack of honesty and lack of commitment of heart into what we do with the knowledge we have. Chapter 3 and chapter 5 the necessary life exposure for effectiveness. What is it? What are they? As theological educators, what we teach is not simply is not simply supposed to be coming from a head packed with full packed full with facts that are unrelated to life experiences and conduct. Of the educator into the hate of those being educated with no relationship to their lives and conduct. Rather, as here in Second Corinthians 3 1 to 6 and 5, 9 to 15, we teach from a wealth of knowledge of ourselves, of God. And of the conducts and values required of us as educators. And we indeed are equipped to educate. Not for the sake of ourselves. But for the Lord. And for the sake of our students. 
for the sake of persuading others who have not believed and also to be shining examples to all of them. Above all, we do this with the understanding that what we teach and preach is livable and it is true. In other words, we are not hypothesizing. We are talking of what we know is true and what we know can be lived practically. This is what Paul shares with his readers and us as his fellow theological educators under Three points taken from our two texts. An educator that knows oneself. God and the guiding values. That's what chapter 3, 1 to 6 is all about. An educator well equipped for the Lord and others, not oneself. Chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. An educator compelled by the love of Christ to live for Christ. 5, 14 to 15. An educator that knows oneself, knows God, and the guiding values. When in 2 Corinthians 1 to 6, we read, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. And you can go on. Paul is in no way in these six verses castigating high theological education. Especially when he says at the last verse that the letter kills and the spirit gives life. This reminds me when one of our Cochrane reverends Pick me one day when I was speaking about the danger of priding ourselves of theological education. He said, Why are you belittling or castigating theological, higher theological education when you yourself has a PhD, have a PhD? What is the meaning of that? Are you discouraging the rest of us for, from aspiring to get PhD? Because you have already got it? Or else what is the meaning? And I told him, I'm not belittling higher theological education. But having attained this level of education, I have come to know how little I know. I have come to know that true education is far more than a paper and a head knowledge. Or far more than having a PhD. For even the first Corinthians I claim to have a PhD in, I know very little. And this humbles me. Not in a very small way. So Paul is not here belittling theological education. Because he too had a, higher, a high 
theology, higher theology, very high theological education. So what is he saying here? He is simply showing his deep theological understanding. Oh, his deep knowledge of God as it affects him personally and others with him who believe in Jesus Christ. He is exposing his readers, including us today, to the fact that because he and his colleagues had taught the Corinthians so well, means that they did not need to have a letter of recommendation from him to anyone else in the world. Because that was the fashion of the day. This he says is because their conduct and life as a result of the teaching was enough a letter of recommendation. To anyone in the world who came in contact with them. Similarly, he himself, as their teacher, did not need a letter of recommendation from them as a proof to anyone anywhere in the world of his own genuineness as a teacher or as a scholar of the new covenant. Thus, the two rhetorical question in verse 1 expects the Corinthians to answer saying, no, sir. You are not commending yourself. We know that. We know you. You are not commending yourself. Oh, you are not praising yourself. Oh, you are not singing your own praise. And neither you know, neither you nor us need a letter of recommendation to prove our genuineness. Why? Because your conduct and our own conducts indeed are enough testimonies to affirm the genuineness of your work among us and as elsewhere. We often think that the Corinthians have a very negative opinion about Paul. That's what scholars say. But when you look at some of his rhetorical questions, it gives you the feeling that yes, there is, a res there is respect between the two groups of people. Between Paul and the Corinthians. He respects them and they respect him. In verse, verse 4 and 5, he gives the basis for his confidence that what he and his colleagues imparted in the Corinthians' hearts was enough testimonial about his own work or their own work. The basis for this is not himself, his academic attainment, but Christ Jesus. And God the Father. In spite of his high academic attainment, he was not ready to beat his drum. Because he knew the higher he went academically, the more ignorant he was. And by the way, in their own time, even among his contemporaries, contemporaries who were not Christians, but we're also scholars like himself. To sing your own praise is a sign that you don't know anything. And so Paul could, and so the Corinthians were not, were not ignorant of the fact that he was not singing his praise. Because they were conversant with the fashion of the day among scholars. And Paul also was, was conversant that if he begins to beat his own drum, his fellow scholars were going to put him down. 
who were not even Christians. Talk less of those who were Christians. So both the Corinthians were aggrieved that Paul was not beating his drum. So he said, the basis of our competence is Christ and God the Father. Jesus Christ in him made him and his colleagues competent teachers and preachers of the new covenant and gave them the confidence to do what they did in the lives of the Corinthians. The Corinthians knew this. Paul himself knew this. And this new covenant of which he and his colleagues were, preach, were teachers and preachers is born of the living, is born of the spirit of the living God who gives life. And it is not the old law from which Paul is coming out from as a rabbinic scholar. Written on tablets of stones and given to Moses which he referred to earlier in verse 3 which he says kills and which the Corinthians prove by their own conduct that the ministry of the apostles particularly of Paul did not originate from this old covenant the Torah that he says kills. Thus for Paul, the theological education to which you and I are called compels us to have a thorough knowledge of ourselves before we can ever be effective a thorough knowledge of God and a thorough knowledge of the world and a thorough knowledge of the lifestyle demanded of us so that we may not falter so that we may not go wayward for without these in place we will be like empty drums that make the loudest noises leading the people to, to destruction and even ourselves. This we are beginning to see in our churches. This we are beginning to see in our churches. The reason that brought about this Congress when we are well informed about ourselves, the vessel God is going to use, when we are well informed about the God that calls us. Not hate knowledge of him. Personal encounter. Personal knowledge of him. When we are well informed. About the values he demands. Of the people that he called. Then. We are in. For a successful work. We will be compelled by the love of Christ that we enjoy to do what is required of us. And this is what Second Corinthians 5, 9 to 15 alludes to. An educator equipped for the Lord and others and not himself. A careful examination of theological educators today reveal that our level of awareness of ourselves 
of God and of the conduct demanded of us are mostly so fleshly to the point that such knowledge is not able to equip us for the Lord and the students we teach in seminaries to the point that it will help them whom we teach and they in turn help the local churches they will eventually serve or teach this is because what we know about ourselves about God and the necessary conduct for ministry are more or less carnal for we tend to desire to be well equipped not to serve God and the people placed under our care but to serve ourselves to give us an age over others in ministry to increase our monthly pay to prepare us to be able to compete favorably for leadership positions and not to make us better instruments in the hands of God for his glory and the spiritual and physical enhancements of all God's people irrespective of tribe status gender or color and so on if you realize in our churches tribe is key in the way we administer the church tribe is key if I am the president if I am the archbishop if I am this my tribe comes first am I right in most of our churches that is, that is what goes on if I become the, re the leader I project myself and the rest must be subservient. Do you realize that in your churches these days now, the voice of the leader is final. Whether you are Roman Catholic from a Roman Catholic church or not, or whether you are from Anglican or not, the voice of the leader is final. So all of us in the churches in Nigeria are Episcopal in practice. You don't oppose your leader. If you begin to say the contrary, if he has said something and you want to say something contrary, everybody looks at you as if you are crazy. And they mark you. It is in our seminaries. It is in our churches. It is everywhere. The voice of the leader is final. He is in first infallible in court even though our doctrine says he's not infallible our practice says the leader is infallible and we cover it by saying this is african theology this is koko agidan giyama akwan sugar beg your pardon those of you who don't hear how sir even in bia palo there is a leader and you must listen to the leader and the voice of the leader is final. Not, not after he has listened to all of us. And then strike down. No, 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 no. Right from the beginning he projects. That this is where he wants it to go. And he doesn't want to cross check whether the idea he has is right or wrong as we are discussing. Before he strikes to know the will of God. Equip to please the Lord and not oneself. Verses 9 to 10. So we make it our goal. We are talking of objective, isn't it? We make it our goal to please Him. Whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 
so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body whether good or bad when you as theological educators truly know yourself your weak points and your strong points your capability and your incapability and you know God from a personal point of view his values his power his invincible power his love and all what and when you know his values that is required of you you will definitely make it your goal to please him and not yourselves or any other person whether in this life or in eternity for we are accountable to God here and now and in eternity it is him who rewards us for the good or the bad we do if that is the case if we will all give an account then we don't have to bow down to anybody if especially the person the leader who is that is wrong that is leading us to destruction that is talking what is not biblical that is self possessed If you will give an account, you can't go to heaven and say, it was my archbishop who asked me to do it. And therefore, Lord, I did the wrong. Not because I wanted to do the wrong, but because my archbishop or my president or my, my chairman asked me to do it. You can't do that in heaven. You can be excused, even here, not to talk of heaven. That it was my leader. We are not in the military. The church, thank God, is not military. Where you do before you complain. That's not the church. You tell, excuse me, even in military, you will still tell, the, the, you will tell, still tell the boss, this is wrong, sir. But if you want me to do it, I'll do it. But in some cases, the boss will listen to you and he will give you in. But we, in the church today, we are so afraid to oppose each other. We are so afraid to correct each other. We are so afraid to say no to each other in love. So that we have the right doctrine. One of the reasons why the church is going wayward and is being destroyed and God is allowing Fulani hearts men and Boko Haram to harass the church for long since 2001 I have been crying the church must go back to the drawing board because we have wronged God too, too much holy holy is too much we sing praises. We show that we are God's people in church. But after we leave the church. It's something else. We talk holy. We pray holy. We speak holy. But when it comes to practical Christianity. Of relating to my sister. Relating to my brother. We are something else. And I think God is teaching us. And that's why it's good that we are now deliberating what is the way forward. And the church is the one that has the answer. But are we courageous enough to take the bull by the horn? Equip to please the Lord and not ourselves. Equip to persuade others honestly and not to show are not for sure of knowledge. And so verse 11. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. 
we try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God. And I hope it is also plain to yours, to you, to your conscience. Since we know what it means to please and fear the Lord, we make it our responsibility to educate those in our care and not to please ourselves. And we endeavor to persuade unbelievers to come to a knowledge of the Lord. And we do this from an honest heart. Whether people understand us and believe us or not. This is what Paul is saying. For Paul, as long as his intentions are known to God, he does not worry. Whether people understand him or not. We sometimes allow people's opinion of us hinder us from doing the right thing. But this is for those who are men's pleasers. Not for those who are God's pleasers. Why are you trying to please somebody? For what? What can man give to you? That already shows your theology. Your crooked theology. If you are trying to please people so that they like you. If they like you, what and so what? So that they give you position, ba? So that they say good of you, ba? And if they say good of you and you are bad, what is it? You see how, how crude our thinking is. We're always wanting people to say good things about us. And we don't care what God says about us. That already so shows we don't believe God. Our knowledge of God is a market knowledge of God. Not a kingdom knowledge of God. In other words, we are selling ourselves to people. And so we must please them at every corner. That is not to say pleasing people is bad, but pleasing people positively. But when you please people because they are doing wrong, and you say, ah, <laughs> you know what that means? We are all sinners, you know. Why are you condemning him as if you are an angel? And that's what has brought us to where we are today. Equip to be shining examples in conduct and knowledge. Verses 12 to 13. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again. But are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us. So that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some people say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. You can see the criticism level against Paul, but he's not shaken. He's not shaken. Because he's not answerable to any man. He's answerable to God. Realizing that the Corinthians would think he is trying to commend or pride himself and his colleagues, he tells them that he is not commending himself. Because he was well aware that self press was even condemned by his educated, unbelieving contemporaries. He 
He therefore tells them he is simply trying to give them an opportunity to answer those who are priding themselves in the physical or material or position. Thus Paul is simply saying he and the Corinthians must walk their talk. As theological educators, we must be transparent in all we teach and do in the presence of our students. So that we are shining examples to our students and listeners in words and in deeds. For Paul and for us, we must not be like the boastful men of God, the so-called boastful men who do not have the gospel and the people at heart, but their personal interests. This was because Paul was compelled by the love of Christ to live for Christ. Says verses 14 to 15. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. Because Paul is aware of himself and is aware of God. Of the God he serves. He was also not. He was unaware of the values. That was demanded of him. As a theological educator. He was not crushed. By criticisms. He was not crushed. By black men. He was not crushed. By marginal marginalization. Why? Because he was compelled by the love of Christ which he enjoyed to do what he was called to do. As theological educators who are aware of the love of Christ for us, this love must compel us not to teach and live for our own enjoyment but to teach and live for Christ who died for us and was resurrected for us that we may have life and have it abundantly. Knowledge alone, brothers and sisters, knowledge alone puffs up, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Knowledge puffs up. But knowledge combined with love builds our students and calms our nerves and egos over and above any frustrations from students, from our leaders at the headquarters or from the devil. What a privilege, brothers and sisters, to pass through these experiences. What a privilege to be equipped for his work and be instruments of blessings for generations after generations through our students even after we have left this planet Earth. To the one who calls and equipped us for this noble work. Thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.